there is a lot of new going on in this church. There is a new schedule, and we're so glad to see those of you who remembered. There is a new logo and a new bulletin, and there's a new website and a new children's. There's all this new stuff. Well, I feel it incumbent upon me to begin a new series with you, and we are going to be talking for the next six weeks or so about the marks of a disciple. What is a disciple, and what does that look like? And so we're going to be appropriately going to begin in Mark in the first chapter when Jesus calls his first disciples. So our passage this morning is Mark chapter 1, and we will read verses 14 through 20. Listen closely, for this is the word of the Lord for you. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This ends the reading of God's holy word. To him be all power and glory and authority forever. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come to your word this morning, we do pray for the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that they would be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. And so we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin with a, this morning with a little bit of congregational participation. I want to ask you a question, and, and if, if, if the answer is yes, I want you to raise your hand. If you, in your heart of hearts, you believe that you are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, would you raise your hand? Okay. Thank you. Now, if you, in your heart of hearts, know that you are a Christian, would you raise your hand? Okay, very good. Now, if you're a Buddhist, would you raise your hand? I'm just, just checking. Uh, but you know, it's really interesting to me when I ask you this question, and I, I've asked this question a number of times, and I, I confess that it's a little bit manipulative. But when I ask the question of you, are you a disciple, some of you... Mm, I, I guess, I don't know, a little bit of uncertainty there, a little bit of confusion, not real sure. After all, what's he getting at? How does he defining disciple? What does he mean by that? Am I signing up for something? I don't want to sign up for anything. <laughs> That's kind of how you respond. But when I ask you the question, are you a Christian? I didn't see any, everybody raised their hands in that one. Sure, yeah, we're in church. We're, obviously, we're a Christian, we're in church. So we kind of think that they are different things, and there is a sense that they are, they are not necessarily synonyms, that there's some difference to them, and there's some confusion and some hesitancy on our part to raise our hands because, well, we're just not sure. This is what I want to talk about you, with you this morning. I want to talk about this whole notion of what does it mean to be a, a disciple of Jesus? What, what is a disciple? I mean, we use that word. It's a very religious word. But what does it exactly mean? What I want to do with you today is work towards a definition. A definition of a disciple. And this is really important because if you are a Christian, this is impacts you. One of the things I'm going to suggest to you is that if you are a Christian, you are by definition a disciple of Jesus Christ. But we're going to talk about that. It's also important to the church because we are about making disciples as a church. This is what we are called to do. And here is where we get in a little bit of trouble. 
George Gallup does these polls on religion in America, and you, you hear me quote him a lot, but George Gallup has a book, and the book is called Growing True Disciples. And in that book, he says that 75% of churches in America, especially mainline churches, are declining or dying. 75, isn't that a sobering statistic? 75% of the churches are declining in size and may have already died. That means, if you're really good at math, that 25% of churches are actually growing. But here, it's a little bit complicated because he also says, of those 25% of churches, 24% of them are growing because of what he calls transfer growth. That's what we in the pastor business call sheep stealing. <laughs> And you know those kinds of churches. It's the best show in town, so everybody goes to the best show in town. And so churches that put on the best show in town tend to grow. But what I find really uh, sobering is that means that 1%, 1% of churches in the United States are growing because they are reaching enough people to, subs to substantively grow in numbers. 1%. 1%. I, I find that really kind of an amazing statistic. And, and 99, that doesn't mean, though, that 99% of churches never reach anybody. That's obviously not true. But what it means is they're not reaching them in significant enough numbers to rely on that to grow in size. Barna points to a problem. He says that part of the reason for that is that 80% of churches have no idea what they're about. In his book, Growing True Disciples, he says that 80% of churches have no understanding of what God's vision is for that church, not only in the coming year, but ever. There is no vision. Some of you might remember that old saying in Proverbs 29, 18, that says, if there is no vision, the people perish. Is this not true of mainline churches? 75% of the mainline churches are indeed perishing. Why? Because there's no vision. And when there is no vision, what that does in a church anywhere is that it creates a void a vacuum. And do you know what happens when there's a void? Something. This is nature. Something is going to come along and it is going to fill that void. In the life of a church, if there is no vision from God, what we are going to do is we are going to energize ourselves with substitutes. And sometimes those substitutes are not very important or significant. Churches that have lost their vision will argue about things like the color of the carpet. They will argue about which key a hymn ought to be sung in. They will argue about insignificant things, unimportant, trivial things. I never, I'll never forget the first time I really encountered this in a really, really profound way. Some of you know, I was an assistant minister in a parish church in Edinburgh, Scotland for a few years, and, and I went there, and part of my job was to create a youth ministry in that community. And so I went to the, what, they, what we would call the church session to sort of present my ideas. There they called it the Kirk session. Kirk is the old Scots word for church, but they do session a little bit differently there. Uh, here we have classes and you, uh, rotating elders. You come on, you're on session for a little while, and then you rotate off. In Scotland, you never rotate off. <laughs> what this means is I went to that Kirk session to present my ideas about youth ministry, and there were 80 people there. That's, it's scary enough to go, but when you got to go to 80 people, that's terrifying. 
And so I got up there and I was real nervous and I had, and I knew it was a diverse group of people and some people were gonna love what I was saying and some people were not gonna like at all what I was saying. And I said, this is what I'm gonna do. This is how, how I'm going to reach these kids and this is how we're going to develop ministry. And, and then I said all that and then I waited to get hammered. And I was waiting for the questions. I was waiting for the objections. And so he, we moved the motion and then we waited. Nothing. Stone cold silence. They didn't say a word. My motion was passed without objection, which I was relieved. <laughs> the next person got up and they said, and she, she was an elder for, that worked with the fabric committee, which is kind of like the building and grounds. And she got up and she said, we're going to remove six coat hooks from the vestibule so that we can put a bulletin board there. And you would have thought World War III had just broken out. <laughs> I mean, these elders argued, and they went back and forth, and it was crazy, and they were getting so mad, they were getting, I thought fisticuffs were going to break out any moment, and they were so red-faced, and there was spittle flying out the corner of their mouths, and it just went on and on, 45 minutes about coat hooks, five minutes about the eternal destination of their youth. Talk about majoring on the minors. To me, that was the ultimate example of a church that had lost any kind of vision, that had forgotten what they are about and what they're supposed to be doing. See, I believe that the Great Commission the Great Commission gives for us our mission statement. The Great Commission, you probably know, is found in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. It says, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Go and make disciples, baptizing them. But as you go, make disciples. This is the mission statement of the church, the church universal. Every church ought to be about that. That is what Jesus said that we were supposed to do, and that is our purpose and our vision. Now, some of you may be sitting there and going, well, that's obvious. Obvious. An old great minister by the name of Dr. Samuel Johnson said, never be afraid to point out the obvious. It's what people forget. <laughs> and it's true here. I do believe that the mission of the church is to make disciples, to be disciples who make disciples. There's another man, another pastor named, by the name of... Um, Bill Hull, not to be related, he's not related to Rick Hull, the former interim here, but his name is Bill Hull, and he wrote a book called The Disciple-Making Congregation. And I want to read to you a sentence out of his book. He says, if the church fails to make disciples, it fails to multiply. If the church fails to multiply, it fails. If the church fails to make disciples, it fails fails. I would think that that is a pretty good accurate description of the mainline church in America today. We have stopped making disciples and 75% of us are declining or dying. Why? Because we've lost the mission statement. We've forgotten what we are supposed to be doing. As disciples, we make disciples. So then, what is a disciple? What, what, what exactly is a disciple? It seems to me that, that maybe it's something more than just someone who says that I'm a Christian. Maybe there's, the Bible seems to talk about more in reg that regards. You want to know that's really interesting about this? Is that, you know, the word Christian appears in the New Testament three times. Three times. Do you know how many times the word disciple appears in the, just in the Gospels and the book of Acts? 296 times. I would suggest to you that part of the confusion that we have is we have it because we have the language wrong. 
And why do we have the language wrong? Is because, well, Jesus in some places seems to be referring, when he talks about disciples, to referring to what I would call the super Christians. You know, the people who know that there is a cost in following Jesus Christ, and they're willing to pay that price. Those super Christians, you know the kind of people I'm talking about? The, the people who, well, they're ready to quote a Bible verse at the drop of a hat, and they can do that. These are the people who speak with a stained glass voice. <laughs> the people who, well, you know, God seems to listen to their prayers because they don't seem to have any problems, whereas I have lots of problems, and therefore I must not be one of those super Christians. Jesus must be talking about somebody other than me because that doesn't seem to describe me. He uses that in different ways. I, I think that in the, the Bible, what we have is that we have this process that when you become a Christian, you become a disciple. This is the first thing that I want you to hear this morning. If you think that you are a Christian, you are by definition a disciple. But in some places in the New Testament, Jesus seems to refer to that when people are further along that path, further along that process. He will talk about them, and it seems to be different. But bottom line is this. If you are a Christian, you are a disciple. I'm almost tempted to ask you that question again and see all of your hands go up. You need to understand that if you are a Christian, you are indeed biblically defined as a disciple. So what does that look like? Well, that's what I'm going to do this series, talking about the marks of discipleship. And the idea here is, is we're going to look at certain qualities over the next six weeks. Things that we're supposed to be growing in as we are disciples of Jesus Christ. But the real th point of this morning is to define it. And we'll look at this definition all along the way. But what I want to do now is work towards a, a biblical definition of what a disciple is. And here's where I need you to turn back with me to Mark in the first chapter. If we're going to define what a disciple is, it seems to me very appropriate that we use the passage that Jesus calls his first disciples to, and use that to help create a definition for us. So verses 14 through 15, we hear the first words of Jesus' mouth, uh, that come out of Jesus' mouth. By the way, Mark is kind of the no-nonsense gospel. It's the way I'd talk about it. He, all the other Gospels provide a lot of context. Mark doesn't. He just kind of gets right in it. Uh, John is preaching. John is baptizing. Jesus is baptized, and now we start his ministry. And in this passage, we have the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news and saying, first words out of Jesus' mouth, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Why has the kingdom of God come near? Because the king has come near. Jesus has left the throne and he has descended upon earth. And now that he is here, that means the kingdom has begun. And since the kingdom has begun, he says there's a couple of things that you need to do. And these help us understand what it means to be a disciple. First one is this. He says, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Repent. Man, you don't get any more of a religious word than that. Repent. Most of us probably know that that repent means to change direction comes from the Greek word metanoia. And metanoia essentially means go a different direction, 180 degrees, change. It doesn't mean that you arrive at a destination. It simply means that you change course in life. In Jesus' mind, this means that you turn away from sin and selfishness and self-indulgence and all of that, and you turn towards Jesus Christ. And you start moving in that direction. It does not, this is, this is important, it does not imply that somebody has arrived, only that they change direction. To repent simply means to move in a different way, towards a different goal. In this case, it is following Jesus Christ. 
So the first criteria of a disciple is this. They have made the decision to change direction. Second criteria comes at the end of verse 15. And believe the good news. And believe the good news. By believing in the good news of the gospel, we are received by grace. By believing in the good news, it means that you become a subject of the king. That you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. See, as the kingdom has come near, so has the king. And if we believe that, then we are his. He is the Lord and we are not. We believe the good news that we are no longer excluded from the kingdom. That we're citizens now of it. That we're part of it. Not because we are good, but because he is good. Not because we have done something to earn it, but because of something he has done. See, we are received by grace. In the gospel, God offers us grace. And to be a disciple means that we respond to that grace by doing two things, by changing direction and by believing. But we respond to the grace of God. There's, but it's more than that. Now, you may be sitting there going, well, that's enough. You don't need to say any more. You got it all handled. It's all good. But it doesn't end there. See, it doesn't end with you making a decision. Decision to change direction and receive. It means that you have to follow. It means that you are going to go after Jesus Christ. If you would look down with me, if you would, to verses 17 and 18. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is another part of the definition of what a disciple is. They are a follower of Jesus Christ. They haven't just changed direction. They are moving in that direction. They are following him. A disciple is one who follows Jesus Christ. Now, in the first century, that was literal. Andrew and Simon, well, they drop their nets. John and James, they leave their dad in the boat with the hired help. Uh, but, but they literally drop everything, and they follow, literally follow Jesus Christ. Now, we don't literally follow Jesus Christ, but we figuratively, we do follow Jesus Christ. There are a lot of implications to that. One of the simple implications is this, is that we learn from Jesus Christ. The word disciple essentially means student. We're going to talk more about this later, but it essentially means a student, one who learns. So the first part of that is that we learn, we gain cognitive knowledge, but we also gain transformative knowledge. That as we follow Jesus Christ, we learn about him, and that knowledge changes us. This is a disciple that we follow him. And, and these guys, in this literal passage out of Mark, when Jesus says, follow me, they just didn't follow him to lunch. That was, it was more than that. They followed him for the rest of their lives. The same is true for us who follow Jesus figuratively. We do this for the rest of our lives. It's not a quick fix. It's not an easy thing. It's not, uh, uh, you receive whatever it is you want and you go on your way. It is a process and it is a challenge that for the rest of our lives, we are going to try to follow him. It is complete and it is total and it is difficult. Sometimes that journey takes us through some rough terrain, but we still follow Jesus Christ. So we respond to God's grace, and we follow. So I want to give to you a definition. This is a definition that I've made up, so if it's wrong, I'm the guilty party. But it is a definition that I want to give to you about what it means to be a disciple. It goes like this. A disciple is one who has responded to God's grace and offer of salvation, and thus commits himself or herself to a lifelong process of following Jesus. One more time. 
A disciple is one who has responded to God's grace and offer of salvation and thus commits himself or herself to a lifelong process of following Jesus Christ. It is about a decision, and then it is about living out that decision. Discipleship, which is a fairly new word, discipleship is about becoming a better disciple. And this never ends. This is something that we do for the rest of our lives. And if we really follow Jesus Christ, we are going to be changed. We're going to be changed into the image of the one we follow. So there's certain marks about that, which we're going to talk about the next week, next six weeks. For example, is the uh, transformed mind. There's going to be a growing dependency on prayer. There's going to be a heart for service, a servant's heart. The relationships with other people, they are going to change. We are going to take stewardship seriously, and we are going to reproduce as Christians. Remember Bill Hull's uh, statement that if we don't multiply, we fail. This is true for each of us. All of these marks that we are going to grow in if we are following Jesus Christ. So, in just closing, if you are a Christian, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, and, and, and besides all of the sort of little hand-raising thing, but you're really not sure, maybe you've never made that commitment. Maybe you've never made that decision. You've never changed away from the sin to focus on Christ. I want you to know that you have an opportunity this morning to respond to God's grace. See, it's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. And if you think that you can live a life good enough to earn yourself as a, a citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, that's not how it works. It works by beginning with a decision. And if you've never done that, you have the opportunity to do that this morning. We're going to pray in a minute, and I'm going to give you that opportunity. But for most of us, maybe it, we've made that decision. Maybe we made that decision a whole lifetime ago. But somewhere along the way, we stopped moving. We stopped following. Maybe we got distracted. Maybe we got lost. And somehow, we have just ceased following Jesus Christ. Well, there's no time like this morning. There's no opportunity like today to start again, to begin again in your following of Jesus Christ. You can do that too here this morning. But here's the thing. My prayer, Sandia Presbyterian Church, is that we remember that we are disciples who are called to make disciples, that we are to, to go and, and make disciples here and throughout the world, and that that is our vision. If we lose that, we are playing church. Let's not play church. Amen? Yes. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, there may be someone here this morning and they're here for the first time and maybe they've not been in church in a long time. Maybe they've never really considered any of this. But they have come this morning sort of checking this whole thing out and they have not made that decision to respond to the offer that you want to make them. Lord, I pray that you are working in their hearts. I ask, Lord, that you would help them understand that a disciple is not somebody who's arrived at perfection. It's not holier than thou, but it is the beginning of a journey. A journey they can begin this morning if they just say yes. Yes to your offer. Yes to your grace. Yes to your offer of salvation. Lord, we pray for those people who might be there. We also pray for a lot of us who will confess that maybe we have lost our way, that we're not following you as we should, and we know it. And more than that, Lord, you know it. So, Lord, for all of us, whether we're beginning this process that is discipleship or whether we've been on it for a long time, we pray that you would draw us to yourself, that we might discover the joy and the life that you have for us in following you. And we pray all of that in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Amen.